Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our gathering together. We thank you for journey mercies you have granted to your servants and your ministers and your people. We praise your name because you have gathered us together for a good purpose. And we pray that that purpose will be fulfilled in every life in Jesus' name. Already we have seen how you started with us in a mighty way last night. And how you have sent your word unto us by your spirit and through your servant. Lord, we are praying that what you have started to do last night in every heart, you will continue to do till we come to the very end in Jesus' name. Already you have stirred up our hearts this morning. 
and you have called some people afresh to yourself those who thought they knew you but you grant them humble hearts teachable spirits that when you yourself through your lead through your servant you made that call they responded oh lord we pray as they have been counseled as they have been told what it means to really know the lord i pray that you bear witness in their hearts that they now belong to you in jesus name father we pray that our coming together to this place will not be in vain that lord you will speak to every heart that every one of us will know you in jesus name and where it appears that some things have happened to our christian lives it appears some things have happened to our christian ministry that we knew nothing about how we pray that you reveal yourself to us in a very plain and clear way in jesus name so that after leaving this place none of us will ever be the same again in jesus name speak to our hearts lead, lead us in the way of righteousness that we may know you more than ever before we thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray we thank the lord who has brought us together for this workers retreat and it's so wonderful to have you coming from far away states, um, Imo, Abia, Anambra, and Enugu. And I'm so happy that you are here. Uh, the only thing is that I will still need to talk to you on our congregational singing. Uh, because the way you were singing this morning, I almost couldn't recognize your voice. And every time I've been in the East, uh, I almost don't want to come back to Lagos because of your singing. I said that these are the people I knew before. Uh, so you're singing this morning, maybe because you are just eating heavy food. It's either I tell them they cut down the meal so that they don't uh, disturb your voice in singing. I like to, you know, hear uh, people from Anambra, Enugu, Imo, Abia. I like you to sing. And um, I would even have even stopped the preaching now and, you know, get you singing again. But uh, I won't do that. But next time, I will want to sing congregational song, really sing so that I will not forget your workers' retreat. Is that all right? Uh, so please, um, we really appreciate that you have come together. And also for those who are now in the hostel, and you say, so there are so good beds like this at the IBTC, I never knew, so I'm going to take all my time, I'm going to sleep. Uh, please wake up in the hostel now and come and join us here. If you are enjoying the hostel, because you never saw that before at the IBTC, come and enjoy uh, the auditorium, because uh, this one is a new thing. And we built it specially for you to come to this workers' retreat. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you know already that uh, we prepared for the church growth conference. And your state overseers and your region overseers, you know, laid the heavy burden on you. And they said they must carry all the money we have in your state to Lagos so that we can build the IBTC for the church growth conference. And after you contributed everything you had, they came again with more announcements. Well, here you are. You have now seen the results of all those announcements. And we praise the Lord for what the Lord has done. Um, in August, I'm sure you know this already, but I'll tell you all the same. In August, we had here more than 40 countries in Africa represented. And we had uh, many denominations, more than 2,145 denominations. And many of the ministers that came at that time, they were mightily touched of the Lord. Already we're receiving testimonies of uh, those that came to that minister's conference. A particular testimony of what we heard in Lagos uh, here. Uh, this uh, minister, the minister was not in, it's not in Lagos, but this minister was invited to come to the uh, minister's conference. And he has this big title, uh, you know, in his denomination. He's a great, great uh, man with a great office. But uh, somebody was kind enough to bring him here uh, to that church growth conference. And when he came, he heard the word of God. And uh, the only sorrow he had was that he went to one of our leaders at the conference and he said, I have a problem. Uh, all that I'm hearing now, if I go back to my denomination, I don't know what I'm going to do. 
because I don't think they are going to accept all this that we are hearing. But the things changed. The following day, he found that same leader. He embraced him like a real brother, not like, you know, his denomination. And he embraced this brother, a deeper life brother, and said, rejoice with me. All those my seniors in our denomination that I was talking about, six of them are here, and they are hearing the same thing. And when he listened to the word of God, even though his name had been Bishop, he went on his knees, on his face before the Lord. He repented like a baby. And he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, then he went back home. The first day he got home like this, he called his wife. He said, you know, after the baptism and the confirmation and everything that we have done before, we now need to go back to the Lord to be born again. And told the wife and said, all the religion and all the office you have held in the church is not important. I want to tell you what I got from the conference. You must repent. You must be born again. And this is what the Lord is doing. But I just tell you that to make you know that it was possible because of your contribution. Because of your prayer. Because of your support. And it is wonderful that after such a church growth conference, uh, we bring you here so that, uh, one, you will see what God has done through you. And two, you also will be able to have benefit from what has happened to other people. I got a report from some other countries too. That is outside Nigeria. And uh, some fantastic things are happening. Uh, people are really coming to the Lord in a particular country, which I don't want to mention because it's going on record. Um, that's because it's being recorded. And this uh, cassette or video may be sent to them. And then that minister may feel so disappointed that, you know, he being a high person, the general overseer of his denomination, that, uh, you know, I talked about him and I made use of his example before people who are just, uh, you know, state overseers and region overseers and district pastors. Uh, so let me hold on to the name and hold on to the nomination, but tell you the story. Do you want the story? Okay. Uh, you know, this uh, general overseer of a whole denomination, he was here at the conference. And uh, it, uh, it happens that I don't know what was wrong with his dressing that he wasn't uh, dressing properly. And then somebody from the conference just went to him and said, Sir, I'm sorry to disturb you, but you know, here we have come to the Mount of Transfiguration. And God ought to change our lives and everything. And he said, I'm sorry to point out that look at the way you are, and look at this dress, and look at that dressing. You will think that General Overseer will become uh, disappointed and will say, Who are you, by the way, to tell me that? He just quietly said, Thank you. And then he came back to the hall and fell on his face and began to pray. And said, Oh Lord, this I thought is a small thing, insignificant thing. And for me to come all the way from my country and for somebody to come and tell me just here when I'm the general overseer of my own denomination, he praised the name of the Lord and corrected everything. And when he got back to his country, he told our national overseer in that country, he said, God so touched me, not only through the message, but through the correction that some, somebody I didn't know, but somebody who is like a young fellow. Oh, it's not like a general overseer that this person came to tell me. Uh, you know, when you see something happening like that, uh, we should be praising the name of the Lord. And more testimonies are still coming in. And you may be reading some of those testimonies in weeks or months to come. I want to encourage you again that whenever uh, we are going to have a program, and we send to you from the headquarters here, and we send to your region, we send to your state, we send to your local government, and we say, This is what to do. I want to encourage you to always respond in a positive way because your response is doing something wonderful in eternity. Now, I told you just now that what was corrected in that general overseer was a seemingly insignificant little thing that anybody would have thought that doesn't matter i can still go on ministering even with that little thing it doesn't matter that that little termite that little fox that little inconsistency that little evil that little influences in my life doesn't really matter that's what many people think 
That's why today, this morning, I'm considering with you little foxes and heavyweights. Little foxes and heavyweights. Thank God for the people that have allowed the Spirit of God to identify and to spot out the little foxes in their lives. And they didn't mind that they bore great titles. They didn't even mind that the person that showed it to them was just like an insignificant member of the body of Christ. But they were willing to say, Oh Lord, if that will disturb my fellowship with you, if that will disturb my ministry in the kingdom, if that will disturb my eventually spending eternity with you, I thank you because you have revealed it and I'm willing to do something about it. You know something? It's a shocking fact of life. That very, very often, some mighty trees and some great buildings are destroyed by little, little insignificant termites. Almost always, those little insects eat away the root and the life of the, the inner life of the tree so that they become unhealthy. And these little termites are very often unnoticed. After the inner life has been destroyed, then it is very easy for the wind and the storm to blow that tree down. I'm sure that from communities where you are coming, you have often seen a tree that you will think is very strong, it's very big, it's very high, and yet a gentle breeze, a gentle wind, when the rains begin in the state or in your locality, that that wind will blow down the tree as you get near. And you look at how that mighty tree, great tree, could be blown down by such little kind of wind and storm. And you begin to examine that tree. You see that long ago, the inner life of that tree and the roots of that tree had actually been eaten away before the wind came. On the other hand, there are times when some buildings begin to sink. You see some uh, in our country, uh, there are some of these grandiose kind of projects that the state government will get into or the federal government will get into. And then what they do is that they build this scene, sometimes a skyscraper, sometimes a magnificent, beautifully painted a building. But eventually, we'll begin to see, if you look from afar, that the building has slanted already. Not only that, you discover that some part of the building is cracking and sinking into the ground. Then they call in the architects and say, what is the matter? This building appeared very solid and very good and very beautiful. In fact, it's a showpiece in our state. How is it? The building is now sinking. And the architect will examine everything and he will say, you know the secret? When this building was constructed, we didn't expect heavy machinery to be put or stored in the building. Actually, the building has been carrying weights greater than provision was made for. And it is a heavy weight that is now making the building to sink and it's about ready to collapse. Well, it's not only May, it's not only buildings that may sink because of heavy weight. Have you not found sometimes, unfortunately, that a person is in a vehicle and the vehicle is moving on? Something happened, maybe an accident. He tried to jump out. As he jumped out, the vehicle then fell on him. And that heavy weight becomes so great on him that the heavyweight will break his bones, dislocate his spine, break his backbone or neck, and that person may be paralyzed for life. Heavyweights damage buildings, destroy men, and destroy women. Do you remember the story in the Bible? It says that these two women, they had each one a baby, and at night they slept. Unfortunately, one of the women became careless. And what happened is that this woman slept on her own child. And the heavy weight of that careless woman upon that living child between night and morning had killed that child. That's the effect of heavy weight. And if it is so in the physical, 
If it is so in the natural, it can be so in the spiritual that the heavy weight just comes upon the individual, upon your spirit and upon your soul. It depresses and oppresses. It destroys and it kills so that the fellow is not able to stand all that he ought to be able to stand. The consideration of a message like this should set you an eye thinking and it should help you and I to detect the little foxes in our lives and to destroy them before they destroy us. Because, you know, it's a matter of time that those little termites, they seem insignificant. It appears that maybe what harm can they do? But eventually, these little termites, if you don't destroy them in time, they come to destroy you. Or it may be that it's some heavy weight that you refuse to remove. And that heavy weight eventually destroys your own Christian life. Uh, have you heard about one great man in history? His name, Alexander the Great. Before he became 30 years of age, he had become a great emperor and conqueror. In fact, at his age and at his time, it's so called the great that nobody ever thought that there will be any greater person after him. But then, before the age of 35, that man, the great warrior, the great emperor, the great conqueror, Alexander the Great, he died. And history tells us what killed him was not a great mighty thing. All that happened it was that Alexander the Great, to celebrate all the conquest that he had, he was enjoying himself. Little did he know there were some little, little mosquitoes all around. And some of these little insignificant creatures, mosquitoes, also got on him at the back, on the nose in different parts of the body. But he still continued his festivity. It didn't appear to bother him too much. All he did is what, you know, we normally do and slap that place and kill the little mosquito. But the little mosquito had dropped some bacteria in his body. And in the night of that same evening, he had become feverish. Before the next ten morning, the malaria had become so serious. In a few days, Alexander the Great died, not because of bombshell, not because of bullet, not because of a collapsing house, not because of accident, because of some little insignificant insects that bit him. How then you and I should be very watchful and very careful that if that happened to Alexander the Great in the natural and destroyed and killed that man, then we who are spiritual, we who know the Lord, especially we who are serving the Lord and working for the Lord, will take care to identify and destroy these little unnoticed foxes that destroy the vine. Point one, the little unnoticed foxes. Let's look at scripture. In the Song of Solomon, the Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 15, Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. Take away from us the foxes, the little foxes, insignificant that anybody could even pass over without thinking about it. It says these are the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. If you know anything about the Christian life, you'll know that the Christian life is quite tender. Spiritual life is a very tender thing. And the little foxes can destroy the Christian life or the spiritual life. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 from verse 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary. To send forth a stinking savor. Now the application. It's giving you a fact of life. It's giving you what those little, little flies could do. He now says, so does a little folly. 
him that is a reputation for wisdom and honor a little folly a little misbehavior a little carnality a little evil a little apparently insignificant thing that others will say but what does it matter brothers and sisters it is the thing that we say what does it matter those are the little little things that eventually destroy we're told in first corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6 first corinthians chapter 5 verse 6 your glorying is not good know ye not that a little leaven leapneth the whole lamb a little leaven leapneth the whole lamb you see there are some christians that will run away from things that are very big from evil things that are very very conspicuous but their attitude to the little little things is that i don't want to carry this my christianity too far i don't want to carry my obedience to the gospel standard i don't want to carry it too far I don't want to carry my faithfulness to the written word of God. I don't want to carry that too far. I don't want to become fanatical in my approach to the Christian faith. But then we are told and we are warned by the apostles through the spirit of God that a little leaven leapneth the whole lamb. Let me show you an example in the word of God concerning that little leaven. In Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. First of all, we'll read a verse and then I'll, I'll back up. That is, I'll go back to reading some other verses in that same chapter that will clear up the whole issue in your mind. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lamb. That's the conclusion of what Paul the Apostle was talking to the Galatian believers from the beginning of the whole episode and it concentrates and nails it right to the point in chapter 5 look at it from verse 2 behold i paul say unto you that if ye be circumcised christ shall profit you nothing i want you to picture this thing that we're talking about and i want you to realize how similar insignificant small and little it might appear when you first consider it what happened is that some of these uh, people in Galatia had been introduced to the knowledge of salvation. And many of them had come to know the Lord by repenting of their sins and having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing in him they were saved. Then some other preachers started coming around to, these, to this province of Galatia. And they were telling these believers and churches in the province of Galatia. And they were telling them, well, you've done something and that's good. You have repented of your sins, that is good. You have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is good. Only one thing. You have not been physically circumcised. You see, you need that little thing, that circumcision. If you really want to stand. And if you want your faith... To be impressive unto the lord and you want to be able to get to heaven to the kingdom of god without any hindrance at all and these galatian christians they were beginning to consider the thing that well maybe we have to do this to complete our faith to do what we ought to do to impress the lord and to fully serve him and they were already wanting to yield to circumcision now if you consider it ordinarily you say but that really matters not. In fact, in other parts of the New Testament, Paul the Apostle himself actually says that whether you are circumcised or you are not circumcised, all that does not matter. What matters is that you are a new creature in Christ. But these people then, they took that insignificant thing, that thing that appears that you could overlook, and they made it to a major thing, and they said, I must do it if i truly and really want to be saved now he told them he said do you know something that little thing apparently insignificant thing if you submit yourself to it it cancels even your salvation 
little thing that other preachers are already telling them you must do it if you don't do it you are not complete Paul the apostle said, it appears little, it appears small, it appears insignificant. If you do it, it cancels your relationship with Christ. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For verse 3, I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Understand. These people that Paul the Apostle was talking to, it wasn't that they were saying that adultery is now accepted as a way of life. They were not campaigning for fornication as a new kind of system that they wanted to get into. Neither were they pro projecting gambling and telling the people that's all right to gamble. They were not even telling them to be worldly. They still kept all that intact. Repentance, they kept it intact. Faith in Christ, they kept it intact. And uh, teaching against worldliness, they kept it intact. And also, all that they were doing before, that they wouldn't steal, they wouldn't commit adultery, they won't commit fornication, they will not bear false witness, they will not be covetous. They kept all that intact. Only this little thing. And this little thing, that you know, some teachers of the, of the Bible, the way they understand, and some preachers of the Bible, the way they understand, oh, they will say it really doesn't matter. They say, what do you think uh, God is by the way? That ordinary circumcision, they say circumcision is a physical thing. If you like, go and circumcise three or four times. That's your business. God is not concerned. That's what they tell you. And they will say that circumcision is what a man, maybe a doctor, or he will take a surgical knife and then circumcise you. How does that physical thing, that's the question they will ask, touch your heart, touch your spirit. But you see, it touches it because you are placing your faith in that thing. You are saying the Calvary is not enough. You are saying the cross is not enough. You are saying that the power of the blood of Jesus is not enough. That you need to add that surgical thing to complete the salvation. And Paul the Apostle said the moment you add something to the blood of Jesus Christ to save you. That that little thing even makes you to fall from grace. In verse 7. Ye did run well. Paul the Apostle had no doubt concerning their salvation in the past. He did run well. Paul the Apostle did not have any doubt to their intention of wanting to follow the Lord in the past. He did run well. Paul the Apostle did not doubt their consecration, their commitment to the gospel and following the Lord. He did run well. Paul the Apostle did not doubt the saving faith they manifested originally. He did run well. Paul the Apostle did not doubt that they were worshipping God in an acceptable manner. When they began the Christian life, he did run well. Then he said, who did hinder you? That you should not obey the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Which means then, some people had been getting to them to try to persuade them. That Calvary is not enough. The cross is not enough. Christ is not enough. What he has done on the cross of Calvary for them, to save them, to cleanse them, to forgive them, to give them peace, is not enough. And Paul the Apostle said, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. That means something. Some people may be able to persuade the Galatian believers and they will so speak persuasively that you will think, well, if this man is not from God, how did he have the gift of persuasion? Well, Paul the Apostle said that a lot of people with the gift of persuasion who have not been sent by God. And he said, this particular persuasion that will tell you that that little leaven is nothing. That little leaven is insignificant. That little nothing can be over. That little leaven can be overlooked. If you do it, it doesn't really matter. It says, a little leaven lifteth the whole lamb. As we look at the word of God, the word of God gives us a lot of examples. 
on things that people do that they will say this doesn't matter and i tell you this is what makes their profession of christianity in the sight of god to be of no value you will find sometimes in our midst we as children of god as workers in the vineyard there will be some things that maybe in the preaching in your local church your leaders and your teachers were correct and you'll just shrug your shoulder and you will say that doesn't really concern me because all that that preacher is talking about these are little little insignificant things i wonder why a deeper life a preacher will even talk about such an insignificant thing i wonder why these people that you know study the bible and they know the bible and these people have been called of god to deal with major issues i wonder why these preachers are wasting their time and they are talking on things that you know are insignificant that anybody if you like you do it if you like you don't do it why don't our preachers major on major things and leave all these little little things they're always talking about in their illustration in their preaching oh because the bible tells us that that little leaven will leaven the whole long and christ will be of no profit to you because of that little thing and then you will be falling you'll be you'll be away from the grace of god because of that little thing and the persuasion in your heart in your mind to take those little little things will damage your christian life completely in proverbs chapter 24 proverbs chapter 24 from verse 33 and 34 yet a little sleep a little slumber a little folding of the hands to sleep so shall thy poverty come as one that travels and i want as an armed man you see from day to day there are some careless arts that we who are supposed to be children of god that we manifest we've slept all through the night and then the spirit of god is waking you up arise and read the word arise and pray unto the lord arise and have what we call quiet time arise and manifest your devotion your worship unto god then you say yet a little sleep yet a little slumber you know that is the reason why many of us according to the language of the writer of the hebrews says the time you should have been teachers you have that one should teach you now the very principles of the oracles of god many of us who are here who have been converted for a long time for some years if we had been waking up very early and reading a portion of the bible a portion of the bible a portion of the bible and we have been reading consistently and praying unto the lord consistently you would have become a giant in the faith it is this little sleep it is this little slumber that makes us spiritually poor and it says so shall thy poverty come as one that travelleth and it says thy want thy lack thy spiritual need as an armed man in james chapter 3 james chapter 3 reading from verse 5 even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things behold how great a matter a little fire kindles here is another little thing that we generally overlook and it is the use of our little tongue and whenever we start using our little tongue in a careless manner we never really think about anything serious and eventually you know that those who talk and talk and talk eventually little lies will come in what they call white lies will come in what is when they say white lie you know what they mean they say lies of no consequence lies that are white lies they according to them innocent lies 
according to them, a kind of life to just, you know, make life entertaining. That this is not really a, a very terrible, cruel, heavy lie. Just little lie. My friend, that is the real problem. It is that little fox that destroys the tender vine and the tender grapes of your Christian experience and profession. And you know, sometimes uh, the use of the mouth, as a person talks and talks and talks, the more you talk, the more you drift away from the truth. The more you talk, the more you drift away from righteousness and holiness. The more you talk, the more you drift away from scripture and from the doctrines of the Bible. The more you drift away from honesty and humility. And this is what causes the problem of many people. You see most uh, sinners... When you even think about it, they are kept away from the kingdom of God. And they are hindered by uh, not big, big things. It is not all sinners that are armed with robbers. It is not all sinners that are prostitutes. It is not all sinners that are drunkards. In fact, the majority of the people that miss heaven, finally, on the final day, will have missed heaven because of little lies. Little delay. I'll get saved tomorrow. That little thing. And tomorrow becomes another tomorrow. And tomorrow becomes another tomorrow again. I'll decide later. Those little delays. Or a little neglect. When the spirit of God is pointing the finger. At some inconsistency in their lives. And you say I'll think about it later. It's a little neglect. It's a carelessness. And the unbelief. And the laziness. And the unwillingness to find out about salvation. Just plain laziness and carelessness. They are not ready. The tract is there. They are not willing to read it now. The case set is there. They are not willing to listen now. The crusade is right there near to their house. They are not ready to go there now. And the gospel church is nearby. But they have not decided they will visit that nearby gospel church. It's a little carelessness. The little delay that eventually makes people to miss heaven entirely. When you think of backsliders, and I want you to think in your mind now. Since you knew the Lord, and others knew the Lord with you, maybe in your own local church, or in the ministry at large, or in some other gospel churches where you know some other believers, think of the backsliders. These backsliders forfeit eternal life while in pursuit of things of no value. When you think about what backsliders run after and what makes them backslide, sometimes they're just the little, little, little things that have no value. Sinful pleasures that do not last. Kind of sinful pleasure that will not last more than a few minutes or maybe more than a few days. Or perhaps it is, ex it is carnal indulgence without any profit. And when you really weigh that sin in the balance... The carnal indulgence is so light, is so little, is so small, is so insignificant. And yet the backslider is running after it. And he wants uh, to forfeit eternal life because of that thing of no consequence. Sometimes it's the unnecessary compromises. That if they didn't compromise, nothing will happen to them. You are teaching in a particular school and they want you to compromise in a little way. And if you don't compromise, you don't lose your job. Or it is in your family that uh, they want you to compromise in a particular little way. And if you don't compromise, there will be nothing. All they will just say is that you are, you know, too religious. Or you, are, you have carried this, uh, your new church, you have carried it too far. That's all they will say and leave it like that. And yet, all these unnecessary compromises with no lasting gain. They are the things that make people thoughtlessly to throw away heaven. And to throw away eternal life. They are the little, little foxes. When you check up your life, what do you discover? It may be the little fox of frivolity. Just that careless kind of attitude. Just the careless uh, way of behavior. The frivolity that actually, it doesn't add anything to your personality. And it doesn't take anything from your personality if you leave up that frivolity. Or it may be talkativeness. And when you, after you've spoken for one whole hour, you try to gather together everything you spoke and it's nothing. And you didn't contribute to, any, uh, to the person you are talking to. You didn't contribute to your own personal life to you. It's just wasted time. Or it may be prayerlessness. And you know it's not difficult to pray. 
if you discipline yourself and just kneel down there or just stand up there or even if you want to sit down, sit down there and open your mouth and just talk to God. Read the word of God. And from the word of God you read. Then talk to God about yourself. Talk to God about other people. But you see, there are people that will live up days and weeks and months without prayer. And it is that prayerlessness, the little foxes of prayerlessness, that will make some people to really miss out what they should get in the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes it is this uh, thing, worldliness. And a worldliness actually uh, doesn't contribute anything to your life. You'll find some people that will say, well, I've got new revelation now that jewelry, there's nothing wrong with jewelry. Well, you'll discover there's something wrong because your attitude is wrong. What you are running after is wrong. Your pursuit is wrong. And you are trying to please the world. You are trying to displease the body of Christ, the people of God, the people who have known you, the people who have studied the word of God together, and those who have taught in your fellowship and in all the areas where you have been granted opportunity to influence the lives of other people. But then because you are looking at the, the wrong crowd, you are looking at the children of the devil, and you want to be you want the children of the devil, the outsiders, to be happy with you, and you don't care whether the believers are happy with you or not happy with you. That's wrong attitude. Wrong attitude. And the wrong attitude behind that little jewelry you want to excuse now is going to mean that little fox in your life that eventually going to is going to destroy your mind. Or it may be that you know you say this uh, position in which I am now. As a manager, as a director, as uh, so and so and such and such. If I am still too strict about this alcohol, it's uh, really going to get me to some trouble. So I think I have to see how to shift a little and come to the middle. I won't drink much, but I will need, know how to use my wisdom very well. And in all these executive meetings, in all these business meetings, what I will do is, I will allow them to put the bottle of beer there. And when they put it there, I just pour it into uh, the cup. And once it is there, all these bad names they have given me that, you know, I'm too religious. If you know that you want to carry religion too far like this, why, have you, why are you in business? Why are you a director? Why are you a manager? And, uh, well, while they, maybe in 10 minutes, I will just take up the cup and sip a little. A drop will not make me drunk. And then I will put it down. After 10 minutes, again, before anybody passes any comment that, ah, Mr. So-and-so, you just put that thing and you are not drinking at all. Or your pastor is not here after all. And we're not going to your church to report you to your pastor. Be free and drink what you want to drink. Before they pass any comment, I take another sip. Maybe, uh, you know, in one, hour's, uh, in one hour's meeting, I take sip just about five uh, times, and then uh, I will shut their mouth. It is that little compromise that will cut you away from where you ought to be. From what the Lord knew about you before, and from the influence and the impact you had on other believers before, it is that little thing that will destroy everything. Sometimes it is during the time of burial. Somebody has died. And now your relatives and your people are saying, now, we're all Christians. You go to deeper life. I go to Baptist. So and so goes to Catholic. So and so goes to Anglican. You know that we are not pagans. We're all Christians. So this is our burial. Now, you know our custom. Now, but don't bring that, your doctrine, into this thing now. We're going to plan it very well. And then they sit in the family and they are planning. And you know a lot of things they are planning. How they are going to shave, you know, the wife of the diseased. How they are going to do this. How they are going to do all that. And they tell you that that is our national cultural way of showing that we are mourning. Doesn't the Bible say that we ought to mourn when somebody dies? Or are you happy that somebody has died? So that's our cultural way of expressing that we are mourning. And then you know the word of God. That you will not go with them. You will not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers to go against the word of God. When Jesus Christ died, because you know that is the greatest death you can talk about, you can think about. When Jesus, our Lord, our Master, our Savior, the Eternal One, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, when he died, how many people did they shave? 
when he died, all these customs are people people are now saying we must do it this way do it this way how many people did that that is why you should take your stand according to the word of god sometimes it is when people want to get married and as you want to get married then the uh, your parents say well it's all right we've left you in that your deeper life church even though uh, when you went to that church we we'll call you the goat of the family because we have all been catholics but in any case, uh, that is a story that, uh, you know, we have fought about it. We have persecuted you. We have done everything, but you are so heady. You said, no, I'm going with that new church. It's all right. Uh, we, and we've seen some changes in your life since that time. But in any case, now this uh, marriage, we, we won't follow you to that your gospel church. This marriage, you will come back to the Catholic church to do it. And uh, the first few days, you say, no, no, no. I'm going to do it in my church because of my brethren. I want them to rejoice with me. Your parents kept quiet. And eventually, after you waited for one month, they didn't yield. Two months, uh, they didn't yield. You say, then you went to the pastor. And you said, uh, pastor, uh, after all, the important thing is to do wedding. And uh, I knew the will of God, and we paid our everything is settled. So, why would I just be waiting and wasting time? Uh, is it all right? Uh, and the way you're asking, your pastor knows that what you want is yes. Is it all right that I go to do it in, my, in the Catholic church of my parents? Although, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I will not do anything wrong. And I will take my stand. In fact, I think it will even be a way of preaching the gospel to those people. And when you put pressure on your pastor, and you are making noise about in the district, in the zone, uh, pastor did not allow me to marry. It is a state overseer, it is region overseer that is my problem. They don't want me to marry. They are having their own children. Here I am, look at my condition now. I would have done this wedding long ago, but they said that I must say, uh, until they do it in this church. When your pastor hears that you are crucifying him and cutting him to pieces, all about he will call you and say... Ah, don't let marriage uh, bring a division in the church. What's the matter? What do you want to do? Eh, what I'm saying is that at least I know I'm a Christian. I'm, I know I'm a child of God. I'm going to, I will do it there and it doesn't really matter. So pastor will say, okay, that's all right. Go and do it there. And your parents will make you see father and father will say, <laughs> you came back. Don't you know you were baptized in this place? No matter where you go, you are Catholic. Uh, in any case, uh, now you are, you are reasonable. You want to do marriage. You know the system we operate here. You will go through the mass before the marriage. Because uh, for us, how can we just call? We cannot make dry kind of marriage with no mass, no sacrament. And uh, since your pastor is not there, uh, you will think and say, well, it's ordinary uh, taking something. That's, that's all right. You say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will do it. You have gone. Because now you have gone into that error, what, uh, the, what theologians are called the error of transubstantiation, that they will take that bread and say, this is the very body of Christ. It becomes idolatry. And that this one is the very blood of Jesus Christ. But because you want marriage by all means at all costs, you go to do that little thing and you say, well, after all, it's a little thing. It doesn't matter. It matters, my friend. You see, these compromises that come into our lives because we're not willing to take our stand. These are the little foxes that destroy the vine. It may be the little fox of pride. You've been given opportunity in your locality to lead such the scripture. And if you led it well, I praise God for you because God wants to raise up more teachers and more pastors and more evangelists and more apostles and prophets. But then, because of the opportunity you have got in your local church, Maybe you cannot be controlled anymore by your leadership in that place. And now pride will totally saturate you. And you'll be walking as if what you did is more than leading sad scripture. And my friend, before you let that sad scripture, others have been leading sad scripture. What have you done that others have not done? And sometimes it is the little fox of pride that comes upon us. Or you know, sometimes... Uh, we, we are blessed of God. And I, I, I thank God for those of us who have been blessed of God. 
and uh, some of us uh, when you came to uh, the church you had no bicycle you had nothing at all and now by the grace of god with all these success principles that god is teaching us in the church and with all the prayer with all the faith and everything here you are now you have an old model books watching that but at least that is a good place to start even though the thing is bringing out smoke we thank god for you uh, but now because of the smoky old uh, Volkswagen model that you have got now, uh, no pastor can see your face, uh, you know, the way we used to see you before. And if we say, uh, brother, can you, you know, to, today we're going to have this special workers meeting. Uh, will you be willing to take the house fellowship uh, summary or the, or the preparation? Uh, you will say, well, then you bring out your key and dangle it like this. And you say, uh, pastor... I will think about it. Because of old smoky uh, books watching. You know, sometimes it is because of pride. Pride on, that means nothing. Pride that other people are using more than what you are using. They have got more than what you have got. And remember, it is a prayer of that same pastor that is talking to you. That has brought this blessing into your life. You see what I'm saying is that there are these little, little things that destroy us. And uh, you see, women, we thank God for you. And you know how we have been serving the Lord. And before you got married, you'll be in the choir, you'll be here, you'll be there, you'll be jumping up and down. And eventually, the church became concerned for you. And everybody was praying that this faithful sister, God will grant her the privilege of getting married. And eventually, you got married and now you have a child. And then we cannot see you in the choir again. And uh, then we cannot see you in the workers' meeting again. And we cannot see you the places you used to be. And when you, you are called and they will say, Ah, sister, uh, what is happening? Uh, we don't see you in the choir again. Ah, <laughs> sir, I'm not uh, a spinster anymore. I'm now a married woman. Not only that, I'm a mother now. And I have to take care of my baby. I have to do this, I have to do that. Well, remember it was our prayer that brought that baby. It was our concern for you that brought that blessing into your life. And you will not use all that, all these little, little excuses to drop out of the work of God. I believe that it is necessary that we should identify all these little termites and little foxes in our lives. And by the grace of God this morning, we are going to get rid of them in Jesus' name. You see the little foxes of malice. And these malice, uh, you know, that I've mentioned, oh, you might say, but I'm a Christian. Oh, yes, we know we are Christians. If we were to, you know, make a test here and say how many people you don't talk to heart to heart. How many people you really, when you, when you see them, you look the other way. And uh, when maybe it is a sister that, now understand, we have different dispositions as children of God. And there are things that you may, for example, the way you pronounce a particular word may be different from the way I pronounce that word. Sometimes it is not your fault, it is not my fault. Sometimes it is because of the part of the country I came from. Sometimes it's because of the part of the country you have come from. And therefore you pronounce it this way, and then I pronounce it the other way. That shouldn't bring malice, or, you know, it's just a difference that we should overlook. But you see, there are some people that will make a great mountain out of some of the cultural differences that we have. And therefore, you will see the two sisters in the same fellowship because uh, one sister will say, I don't like this one. I don't like that one. If Jesus, with all your sin, could forgive you, and he didn't say, he didn't like, you know, you, you having boyfriend, you having this, and you having that, and now he has forgiven you. Why shouldn't you just be in fellowship with your fellow sister? And we brothers too with our fellow brothers. Let's be in fellowship together. And do not allow the little fox or the little foxes of malice uh, to get anything to do with you, to have anything to do with your Christianity. The little fox of self-indulgence. Self-indulgence. No self-control anymore. No self-denial anymore. Or the little foxes of disobedience disobedience and disobedience um, you know may start in you know little little ways eventually it will go up and up and up do you remember uh, Saul the first king in Israel Samuel the prophet said no you'll wait for me for seven days before you 
do anything and it, it wasn't the place of Saul to make any sacrifice. And so Saul waited for second, third, fourth, fifth, six days. On the seventh day, the man of God, Samuel, had not come early in the morning. And then Saul began to look at physical things that the people were dispersing. So he said, I forced myself. Immediately he finished making the sacrifice, Samuel came and said, what have you done? Oh, he said, I hope we can overlook this. Uh, when I saw that you didn't come in time, and look uh, how much I tried. First day until the seventh day. Look how long I waited. And since I saw that you were not coming in time, actually it's not, it wasn't uh, my fault. It's you that disappointed. That's the implication. Because you didn't come at the time I expected you. Isn't that what we're saying? You know, in those early days in, in our church, in deeper life, if, you, if we had Bible study, for example, and the chorus leader was late, and the pastor, the, we, we were not calling ourselves pastors that time, we said the Bible study leader had not been there. And the chorus leader is not there, that we have appointed to be doing it all the time. Do you know what? All of us will just sit down like that. Oh, we had wristwatch. We knew the time was going. But the Bible study leader had not arrived. And we will not question in our mind. Why is the Bible study leader? We never questioned like that. Why is the chorus leader not there? It does not have a place. That's for the Bible study leader to take care of. Nobody will jump there and take loss into his hand. But do you know today? If the pastor is a little bit late because of maybe traffic hold up or because of another thing that he had to look into and therefore he was a little bit delayed and the chorus leader is also not there, you'll find somebody that will just jump there and begin to do something. And when the pastor eventually comes and he says, uh, Brother, come, who put you there? Well, the Spirit of God. Which Spirit of God is causing confusion? Because confusion is not of God. And you shouldn't have put yourself there. Nobody put you there. You see those little, little things. And we say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm trying to work for God and they don't understand me. In the past, uh, if somebody in the, in the district or in the region, uh, you know, when we had states, in the states, he, want, he had this seal and this vision to go and do evangelism in the village. He will wait. He may have 20 dreams. And he may have uh, 30 revelations. And he may have whatever kind of gift. But with all that gift, he will go to the state overseer, or to the uh, Bible study leader of that locality. He will say, this is what the Lord is telling me. And if the Bible study leader of the state overseer said, I understand, but uh, please be patient and let, let things be done decently and in order. Whatever you are doing, it may be, you know, those days it may be just the leader of the evangelism team in the city. Whatever you are doing, just continue to do that for now. All those 30 revelations and 20 dreams, you can still keep them. When the Lord talks to me as your leader, we'll get to it. Do you know that the brother or the sister will just go and sit down? I will bear no grudge. He will not even oppose that leader. He will be, be so gentle and so submissive. Well, that's when we didn't allow the little foxes to destroy the vine. But you know what now? Once somebody has got not even 20 dreams, once he has half a dream. Uh, what I call half a dream, you understand? He has not really totally slept. And it may be the noise that he's hearing all about while he's sleeping up that causes a particular dream. And he says the noise of the people he's hearing is the noise of a great mighty crusade. And then he wakes up from his half dream and he won't even tell anybody. He'll be getting money to buy a loudspeaker system. God has spoken to me. I have the call of God. How many of you will contribute to help the work of God and the ministry of God? And get all this microphone. And then the house fellowship is supposed to lead. As the area leader is passing, going around, the sisters, no house fellowship leader there. And you say, where is brother so-and-so? Eventually, when he comes back, instead of any kind of humility, any kind of apology or repentance, he will say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for my rebellion. Praise the Lord for my disobedience. You know, I've gone to that place now. If you know what happened, and nothing happened there. Nothing happened. Don't listen to them. Listen to me. Are you paying attention? 
when he when he made what he called altar call uh, some of the three year old boys and girls uh, five year old they came out they rushed out and he began to count them and he said they all came to the lord it's a lie and then he will he will justify his disobedience that's what saul did and then samuel said the kingdom is departed from you little thing little thing and then do you remember when saul went to kill uh, the amalekites and he killed every one of them except the king that little sin that he retained that was a sin that eventually destroyed him and and the god told someone he said why well, are you praying for that man i rejected him and i found a man greater better than himself i pray god will not reject us in jesus name it is necessary then to carry out thorough self-examination so we can detect the little termites and the little foxes that destroy the vine of our spiritual life. There's no time for me to read all the references, but you know, do you remember David? And David had been a great warrior, a mighty warrior. A king that God himself delighted in. It so happened at this time that the kings were going to battle. And David himself said, God had taught my fingers to war. God had taught him to do battle. But you know, this man, he didn't go to the battlefield. He was relaxing at the wrong time in the wrong place. And then he saw a woman that was washing in the wrong place. Now here we are. Washing in the wrong place. Uh, we used to have, uh, you know, in our general retreats, we were disciplined people. You know, in our general retreats, whenever, when we didn't even have any hall like this, no dormitory like that, all we had was primary school to use. And some principal of primary school will be kind enough to give us the facilities to use for our retreat. And you know, you know the situation there, and we keep the men here, and we keep the women there. I'm not talking of workers' retreat, general retreat. And then in the first night of the general retreat, uh, the uh, person that is coordinating the whole thing will come and he will tell us that uh, we should not wash in the public, we should not do this, we should not do this, and we outline everything and everything becomes well, uh, well uh, controlled. And in all that general retreat, you will not see any woman, even those sinners who came to us there at the retreat, you will not find them washing in the open. And then we tell them that you men, if you are going to, you know, take water from that place to this place, you make sure you are fully dressed. Don't just put your towel around you. And don't be half naked. We want you to be well dressed. Don't be a stumbling block. A source of temptation to anybody. And you know, in those general retreats, everybody will comply. Here we are. This is workers' retreat. What a shame. If we see any of the women washing outside, or not well dressed and you say another sister will correct them and say sister you are washing outside look at you are exposing yourself you'll be a temptation to these men anybody who has temptation that's his problem if they can't control their body they can't control their eyes that's their problem that's not my problem it's your problem you know that woman washed in the open place like that do you know the consequence the consequence is that sin was committed. And the consequence of that is that she lost her husband. It was that little act of public exposure. And washing in that place she shouldn't have washed. And also the king not going to battle. And the devil arranged all the events and circumstances that eventually killed the husband of that woman. And God said he was displeased and unhappy. Well, the king, not only that, he said, because of this, the sword will never leave the house of David. It even affected, affected the whole nation. You see, those little things, similar little things that we say we do, it really affects other things, other areas in our lives. Now, point two, heavy weights that kill. Heavy weights that kill. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Heavy weights, as I said before, depress and oppress. Burdens cause hearts to sink. 
and wait, slow down the pace and the progress of those who are carrying those weights. The certain sins in the passage I've read to you, like weight, stand as great barriers between us and our God and hinder our running the race to a happy destination. If you allow the weight of besetting sin upon your life, it will hinder you from running the race to the happy destination. Heavy weights may cause permanent irreparable damage on bicycles. Have you sometimes seen when a farmer coming from the farm will be so ambitious he wants to carry a very heavy load and then he puts it at the back of that bicycle and eventually before he knows what, that heavy load has damaged that bicycle. Sometimes heavy load can damage vehicles. And heavy loads, of course, can damage men and women. Unexpected heavy weights falling suddenly on people can paralyze for life or kill. When I was at the University of Ibadan many years ago, there was a family that I used to uh, stay with on Sunday whenever I went to church in town. And in this family, some, one unfortunate thing happened one day. The man there, one of the families, the man was selling cement. And the people that had packed the cement, they didn't pack the cement properly. And this man was sitting down, just uh, relaxing, without thinking that anything will happen. Unfortunately, something happened and the cement bag slipped and just came upon him. Those are weights. That man was crushed. He became paralyzed. And even though he didn't die immediately, instantly, a lot of things went wrong. And eventually they, they had to take the bags of cement off him. Good enough that somebody knew that it happened. If nobody knew, if it happened when nobody was around, that heavy weight would have killed him. And eventually they brought him out. By the time they brought him out, he couldn't sit, he couldn't stand. All he could do was to lie down with great pain and great difficulty. And he suffered that pain for months, for months. And even though he didn't die immediately, he never really fully recovered. Never really fully recovered. And you see, that is what heavy weights will do to a man or to a woman. If you allow a besetting sin, it may be like, you know, there is somebody in your locality. And this is a man. And privately and secretly, this man will come to you. And it will begin in some innocent ways. It begins to touch one another. Eventually, it becomes bondage upon you. It becomes a besetting sin that you cannot shake yourself from. And you are afraid to tell anybody because this man says, if you tell the pastor, I'm going to backslide, I'm going to leave the church, and if I die and go to hell, it is on you. Because if you reveal this secret, I'm going to just bolt away from the church and you will not see me again. And then you are afraid that if I report this sin and this man bolts away like that, what am I going to do? Well, what are you doing even now? Because even the, with what is happening now, this is a besetting sin. And this is a heavy weight upon your life. Whether people know it or not, already you are at the very brink of hellfire. And then it continues on and on and on like that. And you are in that bondage. That heavy weight is upon you. It's already breaking your spiritual bones that are not able to stand. And so we should be careful of besetting sin. Sometimes, you know, it is um, some habits of the past life. Coming back into our lives again. Maybe before you knew the Lord, you were a real drunkard. And uh, when you became born again, drunkenness went and all these evil things left your life. But then because of a lot of things that you have gotten involved with now, because of depression, because you are sorrowful, because you are sad, the temptation will come uh, to go and take wine and alcohol again. You resisted it for some time. But after some time you said, well... Uh, this is too much for me. And very secretly, uh, that nobody will know, uh, you lock the door and in the darkness, in the cover of darkness, you drank what you wanted to drink. And then you cried and said, God, I'm sorry. I will not do that again. If I do it again, don't forgive me. But this once, forgive me. But eventually, one week after that again, that temptation came so strong on you. And uh, you, you say, no, I will not do it. No, I will not do it. And instead of exposing that sin and dealing with it, eventually you went to drink again. 
And then drinking and drinking eventually becomes a besetting sin. You can't shake yourself from it. And as just like you are there and you're saying, what will I do? The sin is like a weight is depressing you, oppressing, and you cannot be what you ought to be. Although you still use bold face, you still try to preach. But what kind of preaching can a drunkard actually preach? Think about it. You try to still serve God and work for God. But what kind of work can a drunkard, a secret sinner, a person that is under that heavy weight of a certain sin, what kind of service can he render down to God? That is why you should detect and you should identify this heavy weight that has come upon your life so that it will not destroy you. If you are sincere to God this morning, I believe the Lord can forgive you. I believe the Lord can change your life. And all these heavy things will get out of our lives in Jesus' name. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 9 and 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful laws which drown men in destruction and perdition. Drown men in destruction and perdition. Well, you know, it is uh, all right to do business if the business doesn't conflict with your Christian life. It's all right to do business if the business doesn't conflict with your Christian stand, your doctrinal stand, the stand of scriptures, the stand of the Bible. But you know, more than I do, how many of our brothers, it's affecting some sisters now, but how many of our brothers have been drowned because of this uh, cheap kind of business? They say that, you know, if you are in that uh, city, and you know, and it's uh, a weather or nature, weather about any of the cities you come from, you know that the great temptation is for any kind of business to go on. And uh, you will say, uh, so and so was my uh, apprentice many years ago. So and so was learning uh, how to sell this, how to sell that from me many years ago. How come? That now my apprentice is riding that kind of car. is doing this kind of thing. And I don't know anything about it. And then you call your apprentice one day. And you say, uh, so and so come. Where did you see this kind of money? Where have you got this kind of business? And I trained you. And you are not telling tell me your mind. And your old apprentice will, will smile and say, Master, <laughs> you can't do it. You say, what is it? A master, church will not allow you to do it now. Because I know you, I, I learned this thing under you. But the way we do it, how we pack it, how we make it, how we sell it, how we, you know, sign this and sign that. Uh, master, you can't do this thing. I say, tell me. And so your boy begins to tell you. And he tells you that this is how we do it and how we do it and we carry it from there and we, you know, have a depot there and have this one there and have this one there. But how do you get through the wolf? How do you do that one? Ah, that one, master, that one, you, I know you will never do that one. What is it? And then he tells you how they do it. That actually we go before that thing comes and we see that man there and see that man there. And uh, we, it's not that we don't give them bribe. But all, all we do is that if somebody helps us show appreciation. And we show that appreciation before the help. Because it doesn't really matter whether appreciation is coming after help or help is coming before appreciation. doesn't really matter. But this is how we do it. But I said, Master, you will not be able to do it. Church will not allow you. And if your church people here, they will excommunicate you. Then you say, okay, go your way. And after the, your boy has gone, then you begin to say, I will remain poor the rest of my life. But maybe I can do this in a better way. I can clean it up. I can use a particular method. And then you begin to go around before you know what you are falling into the ditch. And you give bribe, you give everything. And then, unfortunately, you come to tell us in the church, in the Friday revival hour, you come to give that uh, deceitful testimony that God is prospering me now. You know it's not God prospering you. You know it is bribery and corruption prospering you. You know it is the hand of the devil. You know it is the technique of the world that is prospering you. You see the love of money is the root of all evil. It drowns men in perdition. It's a heavy weight on people that drowns people. Verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith. And pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I pray God will deliver us. We need to destroy the foxes and remove the heavy weights. That leads me to point three. 
destroying little foxes and removing heavy weights. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine. The Lord is calling upon us today that we'll need to repent, we'll need to make a change. And whatever we need to do in our lives so that we can be the people we used to be. Living right, standing on righteousness, and being obedient uh, to leadership in the church. That we will do everything we ought to do so that the hand of God will be upon every one of us again mightily in Jesus' name. In Second Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Can it be done? I said, can it be done? Can God cleanse us before we leave this retreat? Can he put our feet on the narrow path that leads to heaven? And can he kill and destroy the little foxes and remove the heavy weights in our lives? I believe God, and I know you believe God, that God can do it. Why don't you let him do it today? You see, when um, Nathan came to David, and he told him that story, to reveal what has actually happened to David, and David, not knowing, responded and said, this is what will happen to such a man. And Nathan said, thou art the man. David did not make any excuse. He said, oh yes, it's me. I have sinned. And just right there between him and the Lord, he settled everything with the Lord. You know, the Lord is so merciful and gracious that if you discover little foxes in your life, if you discover heavy weights that kill, depress, oppress, and destroy in your life, this morning, you can say, Lord, it's me. And I believe the Lord will forgive you. The Lord will have mercy on you. The Lord will cleanse you. And it will turn you into a new man, a new woman, with the spirit and power of God in your life once again. Can we rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer? And say, Lord, I've seen my problem. I've seen my fault. I've seen my carelessness. I've seen my frivolity. I've seen my talkativeness. I've seen my worldliness. I've seen my compromises. I've seen my excuses. I've seen the danger into which I plunged myself. I've seen my secret sin. I've seen my presumption. I've seen my disobedience. I've seen my rebellion. I've seen my waywardness. I've seen my lack of submission. I've seen my pride. Oh Lord, I come, forgive me and help me and the Lord will help you. What secret sin are you hiding? What secret sin are you hiding? Why don't you allow the Lord to deal with it right now, this moment? If you don't deal with that secret besetting sin, it will destroy you. If you don't deal with that secret sin, that besetting sin, it will destroy you. Have you been prayerless in your life?
Don't you want to go to heaven when you leave this world? That heavy weight of besetting sin can destroy you if you don't do something about it. That heavy weight of besetting sin will destroy you if you don't do something about it. You cannot hide from God. Deal with it. Let God forgive you. Let God change your life. Don't give any excuse that it's only a little sin, a small sin. Identify the little foxes and take them away from your life. Identify the little foxes and take them away from your life. You need repentance. You need complete separation from all the things that destroy and defile. Take away the little foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine. 